Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Am I my brother's keeper? Has often been the agonized cry of mankind when the troubles of his fellows have been heaped upon his shoulders. Our story tells of a man who was not his brother's keeper, but who was designed to be his brother's corpse. And it requires one actor to play identical twins. Now, dual identity roles are difficult enough in the visual medium, but they can be solved by technical tricks. In radio, they depend completely on the vocal skill of the actor. That is why we have asked one of radio's finest actors, Mr. Carl Swenson, to complete this assignment. Listen. Listen, then, as Mr. Swenson stars in The Five Buck Tip, which begins in exactly one minute. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Joe? Yeah, Daphne? You think I should go on a diet? No. But I'm adding weight. Only in the right places. Flatterer. Seriously, if I put on any more pounds, I'll be out of style. What style? The current one. It calls for that slim, chic look. The beanpole look, you mean. Boy, I don't get it. Here we are, citizens of the healthiest country on earth, with hundreds of different kinds of good food. And what are Americans doing? They're starving themselves. Well, it's fashionable. I don't want you to lose interest in my figure. Don't worry, I won't. Say, speaking of that, look at this. Here's a figure with real interest. Oh? $45 billion. It says here in the paper that the investment in United States savings bonds has reached more than $45 billion. What do you think of that figure? Mmm, that's a lot of money. And just think, every $3 invested in bonds pays back 4 That's real interest for you. I know. And every savings bond is guaranteed by the government. Right. Oh, Joe, I wish you cared about my figure the way you do about those bonds you buy every payday. Honey, I've got great interest in both. Well, you just see that you stay that way. And now... Five Buck Tip, starring Carl Swenson. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I had flown all the way from Cleveland to be with my brother on his last night, and it was no joyride. His picture was on page one of the Tribune under a big black headline. Governor denies appeal. Jardine to die tonight. On the plane, they all looked at me like I'd broken out of death row. I couldn't blame them. Tommy Jardine was not only my brother, he was my identical twin. At midnight, he'd be gone. This black shadow, this evil image of me that had forced me to run away and change my name so I could make an honest living. Jackie Cavanaugh, his girl, had begged me to come on and... After all, I felt I owed him this last night, just for the relief I would know afterward. I found the Blue Hour, a quiet little bistro where she'd asked me to meet her. Stopped at the check stand, leave my hat and suitcase. One hat, one bag, yes, sir. Uh, do something for me, will you? Don't let me leave without them. I do that all the time. Yes, sir. I'll remember. Hey, you know, you look like... Yeah, I know who I look like. I'm supposed to meet a Miss Cavanaugh here. Yes, sir. In the corner booth, red coat. Thank you. I fumbled in my pocket for something to help his memory. Found a bill and laid it on the counter, thinking it was a single. I didn't know until later it wasn't. It was a five. All things considered, it was the best five dollars I ever spent. Jackie Cavanaugh was staring into her scotch, looking very lonely. And she had reason to. She'd been in love with Tommy for as long as I could remember. Sit down, Mark. Thanks. What time will we do over there? 8.30. No visitors until 8.30. The warden's a bear cat for rules. You're looking more like Tommy every day, Mark. There's nothing I can do about that. Try to be kind to him on his last night, will you? Yeah. I'll, I'll try. I had a double scotch. And then another one. And we sat there for a half hour with Tommy's picture staring at us out of page one. 
Then we slipped out a side door and caught a cab for the prison. The warden was a thin-faced, white-haired man with a tired, worried look in his eyes. I'd like you both to know you're legally entitled to visit Tommy Jardine tonight. But I must also make clear I don't approve of it. Why not? He's facing the greatest trial a man can be put to. He can do it best alone. He's called for his parish priest. Two of them are down there now. But if you insist on seeing him, you'll have to decide now. In five minutes, the main gates will be locked until after the execution. Mark, I... I think I'll stay here. Well, I thought... So did I. But I... I just can't bear to go through with it. I understand. All right, Warden, I'll see him alone. So you're the twin brother, huh? How come your name's different? I changed it. I don't blame you. You know, it's funny, up to now, we didn't believe he had a twin brother. Thought it was all part of the act. What act? Well, you know, it's against the law to execute an insane man. You mean Tommy is... Crazy as a coot. Or at least that's what he'd like us to think. It's turned into an endurance contest. Three days and nights without a let-up. And you know what it'll add up to, don't you? He'll go to the chair, sound and sane, and we'll go to the nut house. Uh, the priest is in there with him. All right, go ahead. Uh, excuse me, Father. Yes? You got company, Jardine. Hello, Tommy. Huh? What do you know? So you had the nerve to come after all. Padre, shake hands with my brother. I'll be back in 15 minutes, Mr. Heston. Hey, listen to me, you idiot. My name is Heston. Mark Heston. Shut up, Jardine. That, look, do I have to die to prove it? Padre, how can I convince him? What can I do? Look at him, Mark. <laughs> you see what I mean, Mr. Heston? He's been going on like this day and night. He's driving us nuts. <laughs> He'll be all right. Funny, seems to come over him every so often. Perfectly rational one minute, and then... Yeah. Well, Padre, see you in 15 minutes. Tommy. Tommy. Huh? What? What happened? Did I do it again? Yes, son. You said you were Mark, just like before. Oh. Mark? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. I don't know why. I, I, uh... We understand, don't we, Mr. Heston? Sure. Is there anything I can do for you, Tommy? Afterwards? Well, he does have some personal affairs to clean up. Yeah, I'll, uh... I'll be leaving some cash, for one thing. Uh, and a safe deposit box in Detroit. And, uh, there's a car and some uh, personal stuff. That'll all go to Jackie. I took a pencil out of my pocket and looked around for something to write on. Sticking out from under the Bible on the table was a blank card, so I picked it up and turned it over idly as I waited for Tommy to go on. There was printing on the back. It said, Fingerprint Record, State Penitentiary. And it had Tommy's picture and history. But the spaces for the fingerprints were blank. Then they jumped me. I got him, Tommy. The arms, Mike. Get his arms. Got him. Get the needle inside the book. Pages cut out. Okay. Hold him still now. All right, come on. Come on, Jardine. Wake up. All right, snap out of it, Puck. All right, get the leg out from under you. That's a boy. All right, now. Hey, wait. What, what, is, what are you doing? What is this? Look, Jardine, will you save the act for the newspaper boys, huh? Look, I'm not Jardine. I'm Heston. I'm Mark yeah, Heston. I'm Marilyn Monroe. Hey, wait. Listen. Oh, you listen, Jardine. I'm fed up with this act. You either play ball or job or no job, I kick your teeth in. Let go of me. What are you doing? I'm slitting your trouser leg because that's where we fasten the electrode. It's ten after eleven. In less than an hour, you go to the chair. We continue with the second act of 
Suspense. Memo on medals. Interesting information about our military awards and decorations. Campaign medals were authorized by Congress in 1905 for all officers and men engaged in specified wars and military action, including such widely divergent battles as the Civil War in the United States and the Boxer Rebellion in China. The Navy and Marine Corps have a special Manila Bay Medal for members of the United States Asiatic Squadron under command of Commodore George Dewey in May of 1898. The Haitian Campaign of 1915 is commemorated with a medal, as is the Santo Domingo Expedition, which suppressed a revolt in that country and preserved order during elections in 1916. The Army has its Mexican Service Medal for those involved in any of several expeditions or engagements from April 12, 1911 through June 16, 1919. There is also the Army of Cuban Pacification Medal for United States troops who, from October of 1906 to April of 1909, helped establish a stable government in that island nation. The Victory Medal was initially awarded to all United States service personnel in World War I expeditionary forces, including, for the first time, women serving in the military units. There is a story behind every American medal, a proud story of devotion to country and unselfish service to keep it strong and free. And now, starring Carl Swenson, Act Two of Five Buck Tip. Slowly, one by one, the facts came into focus. I was in cell four of death row, in Tommy's prison uniform. The guard was shaving my leg because in less than an hour, I was going to the chair in my twin brother's place. Uh, hold still now, Jardine. Look, I'm not Jardine, I tell you. I'm Mark Heston. Now get that through your thick skull and then bring the warden here. You'll see the warden in 45 minutes. The law says he's got to be there when they pull the switch. Look, do you see this on my arm here? What about it? That is a mark from a hypodermic needle. That was why I was asleep just now. Uh-huh. The Padre, do you remember him? Yeah. He's a phony. His name is Mike, and he's a friend of Tommy's. And he had the needle inside the Bible that he was carrying. Is that so? And they hit me right after you left. Now, I know it sounds crazy, but they pulled it off. Oh, they should have known better than to try a wild thing like that now, shouldn't they? You don't believe me. This mark on my arm. Now, look. You gotta believe that. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. You showed it to me yesterday. I wasn't here yesterday. Uh-huh. Listen to me. That was part of the build-up. Can't you see that? Like the Insanity Act and everything else. Listen to me, you stupid jerk. The rule book says we don't rough up the customers, Jardine. However, in your case, I'm going to make an exception. Please believe me. My name is Heston, Mark Heston. I've got an apartment on Riverdale Avenue in Cleveland. I work for the Ohio Indemnity Company. I... I said I had enough talk. We went through that yesterday, too. Now, wait. One more thing. You picked me up at the warden's office tonight. Do you remember? Tommy wouldn't know what we talked about. About my name first. You asked me why it was Heston, why it was different. Then about Tommy's act. Oh, sure. You You pumped your brother about that stuff while he was here. He told me when he left with the Padre. All right, then. Put down that chair. Get the warden. Give me that chair. Get the warden. Okay, John Dean. I'll get the warden. I can't stand it. I can't stand it another minute. Look, Warden, I gotta get her out of here. She's going to pieces. Can't you see that? I made that clear to you, Mr. Heston. The main gate's locked until after the execution. Regulations, can't you forget? Let me go! I can't stay here while I kill him. Let me out of here! Please, Warden! All right, I'll call the gate. Come in. Uh, Warden, can I talk to you for a minute? What is it, Louis? I can't handle Jardine. All right. Excuse me a minute, please. Tommy. Shut up. I got a feeling we're not going to make it. You're doing great. We'll be out of here in five minutes. What are they talking about? What's he telling the warden? Shh. 
Can I... Can, can I go now, Warden? I'm afraid you two will have to stay here in the office for a few minutes. I may need you. Well, let's see now. I got off the plane at the airport and took a cab to a bar called the Blue Hour. She said she'd be waiting there for me. Jardine, listen to me. Don't call me Jardine. I'm Mark Heston. There's only a half hour to go, Tommy. This won't do you any good. Warden, please, listen to me. He has been planning this for weeks. The girl, too, and that phony padre. They had it all worked out right down to the pinprick in his arm. Now, please, just let me talk to them. Give me two minutes with them. That's not much to ask, is it? The girl couldn't take it. That's an act. Can't you see that? It's an act. Louie. Yeah, Warden. Mr. Heston and Miss Cavanaugh are waiting in my office. Bring them down here. Yes, sir. Well, what about Mike? Mike? That phony padre. He left. He said he couldn't do anything more for you. He said it was up to the prison chaplain now. Chaplain? Warden, can't you... Tommy, listen to me. Tommy, Tommy, I'm not Tommy! I'm Mark Heston! In just a moment, we continue with the third act of... Suspense. We have, together, ample capacity in freedom to defend freedom. This is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The 15 nations comprising the North Atlantic Treaty Organization have reaffirmed their faith in the aims of the United Nations. They have reaffirmed a desire to live in peace with all people, all governments. NATO is a framework within which the member nations can cooperate in every way to achieve peace and freedom for the world in our time. The United States of America is a part of NATO. You should be aware of and alert to the objectives and programs of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And now... Starring Carl Swenson, Act Three of Five Buck Tip. I'm sorry, Tommy. I'm sorry. Jack, I want you to realize what you'll be doing if you keep on lying. You'll be killing me. You'll be killing an innocent man, just like shooting him with a gun. It's murder. Tommy, please don't. And they're going to find out sooner or later. Tommy. Listen to me. I just told the warden how we met at the Blue Hour. You were wearing that red coat so I could find you, waiting for me in the corner booth. Blue Hour? Yes, you remember that, don't you, Jackie? Uh, the Blue Hour? A bar on North Lake Street. Oh, well... <laughs> Answer me! Warden, call them. Call the Blue Hour. They'll tell you that I was there. It's my job to give you every reasonable consideration, Tommy. But there are limits. Limits? This is the limit. This is ridiculous. What, a... what about the fingerprints? You have his fingerprints here on file, right here in the prison. Why don't you... I remembered then. The blank fingerprint card sticking out from under the Bible. There was a faint smudge of ink on my fingertips. They had thought of everything. I thought it might come to this, Tommy. We stopped at the files on the way down and picked up your card. Give me your hand. Warden, I forgot to tell you something. Give me the ink pad, Louis. Hey, yes, sir. No, Warden, I... I hope this will settle it once it and for all. It won't settle anything. I looked at Tommy while they took my prints. The corner of his mouth was twitching again. But he didn't dare look me in the eye. Well, there you are, Jardine. They match perfectly. Well, of course they match. They're my prints on the card. My brother and that phony priest took them while I was unconscious and switched cards in the files. Come on, Louie. Yes, sir. Tommy, it's 20 minutes to 12. Prison chaplain will be here in five minutes if you want him. Wait! Look, don't you walk out on me. I am Mark Heston, I tell you. There was a switch. Look! Look at him! Can't you see it? You've got the wrong man! The wrong man! There was my last faint hope. 
And all that was left was the horrible, unbelievable truth. They were going to do it. They were actually going to execute me. The lights dimmed, then brightened, and then dimmed again. And from down the corridor behind the door came a faint whine. With 15 minutes to go, they were testing the chair. Fifteen minutes. The prison chaplain came in. I had nothing more to say, nothing anyone would believe, so I told him to go away. Then Louie came back with a couple of assistants and they shaved my head. Eight minutes. Seven. Six. A kind of paralysis took me. I could hardly stand up. I could hardly breathe. Three minutes. The chaplain came back again and more guards. Finally, the door to the block opened and the warden walked toward my cell. The hands on the clock over the door were almost straight up. The time had come. The warden moved slowly through the crowd of witnesses, white-faced and shaken. He took my arm. Come on, Mark. Okay. There's nothing left to... Wait. You called me Mark. Sit down, Mark. Where are my brother and the girl? They're holding them downstairs. There he is, Warden. Name is Willie. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, Mr. Heston. I know it sounds kind of stupid to say I'm sorry, but... No, no, forget it, Louie. Thanks. Uh, you probably don't remember me, mister, but... Sure, you're the, the hat check kid at the blue hour. I was reaching for the phone to call the gate so your brother and the girl could leave when it rang. They were calling about Willie here. He was at the gate trying to get in. Well, Willie, how did you... Uh... I waited till the taxi you took came back, and I asked the driver where you went. Yeah, but why? Well, you left your hat and bag. Well, why did you bring him here? Well, I didn't know what was in the bag, but I knew it must be awful important. You told me not to let you leave without them. Well, I might have let it go, but... After all, mister, you left me a five-buck tip. Suspense. In which Carl Swenson starred in William N. Robeson's production of Five-Buck Tip by Harold Swanton. Supporting Mr. Swenson in Five-Buck Tip were Kathy Lewis, Henry Blair, Jack Crucian, Jerome Thor, and Ken Christie. Listen again next week. When we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Suspense has been brought to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.